Well, there you go, ladies and gentlemen. You just heard the defense's opening statement really rebutting all of everything that you heard in the prosecution's opening statement. A lot to dissect here. So let's talk about it. I'm here right now with criminal defense attorney and former prosecutor, Bob Bianchi. Bob, good to have you back on. Great to be back on. Thank you. We were talking about in the break about how important it is to have an opening statement. Um, and we heard the defense's opening statement. And you, I, you were talking about in the break, she did a great job of really, really going against each of the arguments put forward by the state. I've been basically preparing to practice law since I was five years old, since I have an 86-year-old father that still is a great trial lawyer to this day. And I get excited when I see great lawyering in the courtroom. And unfortunately, I think it's getting less and less. This is an exception. Mm -hmm. She did a phenomenal job. She was poised. She had cadence. She didn't go in there and just do the typical defense opening that says the flag and the Constitution and proof beyond a reasonable doubt. She went right for the state's facts in this case. And she did a very good job at dismantling it. And she, what we know, Jesse, in trial law that is counterintuitive, and your viewers would probably be interested in this, is everybody looks for the sexy stuff like the closing statement or cross-examination. But we know as trial practitioners that your first crack at the jury in the opening statement sets the tone and it's really important to let them believe that you're credible and to tell them what your side of the story is because that is going to form opinions immediately and most good trial practitioners know the opening statement is probably the most crucial part of the case because of that. And I think she had ample material to go with here because if you want to talk about a case that has reasonable, if you, a case that has um, reasonable doubt here, you'd have to imagine that this is the case. Um, Bob, what I want to show you right now before we go back is there's a lot to discuss. Uh, two things, ladies and gentlemen. Number one, you can go to Long crime.com right now and you can watch the G uh, James Worley case out of Ohio. I'm looking at a live feed. You can watch it right now. It's that case of a man who's charged with the abduction and murder of a 20-year-old University of Toledo student. Her name was Sierra Joggin. That case is currently underway. You can go and watch that. What we're going to focus on right now is the Tex MacGyver case. And what I want to play for you real quick is the prosecution's opening statement. This is the first part of it. It's very short. I want to play that for you so that Bob and I can fully discuss how the defense did in counteracting these arguments. Take a look. And over the three-year period from 2013 to 2016, our financial expert, Mr. Dean Driscoll, was testifying that he received $198,000 from Diane MacGyver. In addition to the $198,000 that, that he received from her, she gave him a loan for $350,000 in 2011. This wasn't a, hey, you can pay me back whenever you get the money. This was an actual loan with a promissory note. And the loan was secured by the ranch out in Putnam County. And based on his financial condition, the defendant would not be able to repay this loan. In fact, the evidence will show that in 2011, when she gave him the loan, it was due in 2014, and he hadn't paid it. So she renewed it, so that it would be due in December of 2017. And the evidence will show that over that period, he made interest-only payments and never paid any money on the principal. Diane had told Ann Schwal, the mother of Austin, that she was going to leave the ranch to her godson. And Diane loved Austin so much, she would never draft a will without Austin being included in it. And the evidence will show we will have Mr. Carlton Morse, expert in real estate, testify that unless Diane McIver foreclosed on the ranch and took control of it, she couldn't leave the ranch to Austin. The evidence will show that Diane could take control of the ranch by foreclosing on it if the defendant did not pay. The defendant did have a pension, and our expert would testify that based upon his spending habits, it would be depleted in two years after he retired. And in addition to that, without the money from Diane that he was receiving every month, on the time of her death, the defendant wouldn't even have one dollar. 
Some good tactics by the prosecution in their opening statement, and that's what we're analyzing right now, the prosecution and the defense's opening statements in the Tex MacGyver case. Again, a prominent attorney who was charged with the murder of his wife by shooting her in the back seat of, his, of a car that they were both driving in, and he is claiming, his defense team is claiming that it was an accident, that the gun went off unintentionally. And the state is saying that he really did have a motive to kill his wife. Now, what we saw earlier, if we're going to play it real quick, is uh, during the defense's opening statement, when they talked about the relationship that Diane had with Tex and that they loved each other and that this was all an accident and that this was an entirely uh, a misunderstanding, Tex started to cry. And the jurors saw that. This happened today. Uh, emotion on the part of the defendant. I'm here with a criminal defense attorney and former prosecutor, Bob Bianchi. Bob, as we watch this, a uh, defendant crying, how does that affect a jury? Well, it depends on whether the jury perceives that it's truthful and, and a real cry or whether it's a production, which we see many times in the courtroom. And when this was going on, I was actually looking very deeply into his eyes to see the whites of his eyes were, in fact, red. Um, and, and it did appear that it was genuine. So what, how do I feel in this particular case, the way it came out, the way I saw it, if the jury sees it the same way? powerful in favor of the defense. Let's talk about that motive. Obviously, motive is not an element of the crime, but it does make a good story. And it's important for the prosecution because what you hear is a, a couple that seem to love each other and that uh, different accounts say that they really didn't fight. There was nothing out of the ordinary. But the financial aspect of the relationship is interesting. So what we heard is that um, Diane was very successful. She had, when they married, $12 million. She was worth $12 million. She was the CEO of a company. She ran three, she owned three other companies. Uh, Tex was kind of fading out in his career. He uh, was no longer an equity partner. He was an income partner. He was moving towards retirement. He, he, he needed some money. The idea that she loaned him, uh, she lent him a loan, there was a promissory note on the loan, I'm not married. The idea that one spouse, uh, this is their second marriage, they come together, they're both pretty successful, loaning money in that fashion, what did you make of that? It's a little formal for a marriage, no? I see this a lot with people that have a lot of money, and in almost in their world, not my world, and I guess perhaps maybe not yours, we don't understand the, these kind of things, but they do, and they've been dealing with lawyers and trusts for, for many, many years, so I don't think that there was anything unusual about this financial relationship. I have clients that have considerable amount of money, and they have prenuptial agreements mm -hmm. and various things to protect their assets. I want to go to a point that you just indicated, though, about motive. Uh, as a prosecutor, a homicide prosecutor myself, motive, although, as you indicated, you don't need it. You love to have it, but you don't want to overextend it if you really don't have it in the case. And I think that this is going to come back and bite them in the backside of the prosecution. I agree with you. As the defense attorney basically said in their opening statement, Diane was his cash flow. Mm -hmm. He was getting money from her, that she was supplying the kind of life that they had. So to kill her, doesn't it seems to go against his interest right I think that them bringing this out as a potential motive is going to have a backlash and the last time we talked about this case uh, maybe a week or two ago before this actually came up I told you that in my mind if you the way this was done with her best friend in the car and and the circumstances and close to the hospital as the defense lawyer did a very very good job of bringing it out is just not the way you would go about doing this and I said the prosecution better have really solid forensic evidence to show and I, I've handled cases like this. If I don't have an ironclad motive and I don't have a, a definite smoking gun, no pun intended, in a case, and I'm going on forensic evidence, it better be pretty squared away. And what did we hear from the defense here that was in a plastic bag, that it was shot sideways, that it was in the lower part of the back? And she, rhetorically, I love this defense lawyer. I, I'm really excited about her her skill and her, and her stuff. She says, is this the way a person would go about murdering somebody? And I think that that is a question that's going to resonate in the jury's mind throughout this bad bad for the prosecution because we're talking about reasonable doubt what is reasonable is it reasonable doubt that this maybe was not a murder but an accident and what we're showing you right now in case you missed at the beginning part of the prosecution's opening statement I want to continue playing for that and then when Bob and I come back we're going to talk about the pressure that it takes to fire that gun we thought we heard it from the prosecution but the defense kind of explained that away. Take a look at this. In addition to putting the gun in a plastic bag, eight hours before the murder, the defendant asked Tanner McKinney to take Danny Joe Carter back to Atlanta. 
Now, Tanner McKinney and Samantha Watson are two young adults that come out to the ranch on a couple of Sundays out of the month in order to groom the horses and to walk them or to ride them. Tanner will testify that he lives in Athens. And he'll testify that he remembers the defendant asking him this because he knew that Danny Joe Carter lived in Atlanta. So he was confused by the request of the defendant to take Danny Joe to the opposite side of where he lived. In addition to that, the, our expert Michael Knox, who is a crime scene reconstructionist, and an expert in ballistics and firearms, recreated this crime scene. He took measurements, photos, and he recreated the nights of that, the, the circumstances of that night. And based upon the trajectory of the bullet and the injuries to Diane, he concluded that the, ga the gun was aimed at her back. It wasn't on a lap, it didn't accidentally discharge, it was aimed right at her back. The gun that was used, the 38 revolver, was in perfect working condition. It was, te it was tested by the GBI and Michael Knox. They fired it and they did other testing on it to determine that it had no hair trigger. In double action, it required 12 pounds of trigger pull for it to fire. And in single action, it was two and a half pounds. Okay, let's break that down for a little bit. Bob, okay, so you have a gun, seems to be in working condition. It was in a plastic bag. Now, from one perspective, you could say, as the uh, prosecution says, okay, you keep a, bag, a gun in a plastic bag because it contains the gunshot residue. It won't get on your clothes and hands. Why does that matter? We know that he shot her. Uh, it, it's Jesse, this, this is the stuff, I think this prosecutor, with all due respect, did not do a very good job with this. Exactly. What sense does that make? It's a shooting. She's dead. There's going to be no question that the ballistics are going to come back to that weapon. There's a, there's a witness in the vehicle. He, they're driving her to the hospital. So when they're conflating these facts in the opening statement with the jury, the jury's sitting there listening to this. When she says, for example, and she points that directly in her back, when we know the evidence does not show that she was shot directly in the back, she's losing credibility. And as a prosecutor, even more so than a defense attorney, I can tell you from having stood in the heat of the courtroom myself of anything that I'm going to make sure I preserve in front of that jury from the opening statement through the closing statement is my credibility. And I don't want to say anything that I can't prove or anything that the jury is going to sit there and say, hey, that wasn't right what he said. That doesn't make any sense. And this happens in the opening statement. What happens after that? The defense attorney comes in and smashes it with pretty solid forensic evidence. Well, again, as we know, the openings are not evidence. So they're going to have to back up all their claims by evidence. So we don't know as of yet whether he was actually holding the gun straight out or whether it was on his lap. But here's an interesting part, and I want to talk about this. When she mentioned later on, and we're probably going to play a clip of this, it took 12 pounds of pressure, it's not a hair trigger, 12 pounds of pressure to get that 38 caliber uh, revolver to fire. That's a lot, okay? That's a lot. You, it, it doesn't make sense to fire by accident. However, the defense attorney countered that and talked about double action mode mm -hmm. and single action mode and basically said if it was on a double action mode, uh, then that's when you would need 12 pounds of pressure. But single action mode, two pounds. It's almost a hair trigger. Right. How do they jump at that point and how do they, they, there's no way to determine what pound of pressure it was, but doesn't that leave a little doubt in the minds of the jury? Well, you're hitting the home run with that question, Jesse, because in your question it answers a very important part. The prosecution has to prove its case beyond a reasonable doubt to 12 jurors. What the defense did was counter with the fact that just a bump maybe in a car or a flinching in a certain way, she's arguing that the gun was pointed sideways, could cause that weapon to fire if the hammer was cocked back on the revolver. And that is devastating to the prosecution in the case because the prosecutor cannot and will not be able to explain in this case whether it was in double action or single action mode. And that is what we call reasonable doubt. Do you think it was a mistake by the prosecution to up these charges? Because when we talk about this from a perspective, if you have a loaded gun and you really take the per defense's perspective here that you have a loaded gun, he was sleeping, and he fell asleep and woke up, he's obviously the re reason Diane's dead. We can all say that. But they originally charged him with reckless conduct and I believe involuntary manslaughter. Now they up the charges. 
Was that a mistake? It seemed like a slam dunk case if they would have kept it the way that they did. Yeah, well, this is a very complex question. It's a very nuanced, tactical, practical question. They have a slam dunk case, and in the end of this case, they're going to be charging some sort of involuntary manslaughter anyway. So the prosecution may have thought, let me up the charges to purposeful and intentional murder because they believe the murder occurred based on the false, quote unquote, they believe false statements and other evidence. So I'll just bring out two practice points here. First off, I'm going to tell you from a person who has dealt with ballistics as a prosecutor, as a defense lawyer, there is no way that expert for the prosecution is going to get up there and talk about the angle of the weapon, the way the bullet went through the seat and all of that, that this was pointed directly at her. If they do get up there and say that, I mean, obviously we know it's pointed at her direction, but mm -hmm. if they do get up there and try to imply that it was intentional, and it's only a forensic case at this point, Jesse, I think the defense lawyer is going to dismantle that expert because they can't come to such conclusions like that. And I think the second thing that's going on is the prosecutor felt in the case that because he lied, therefore, he must be guilty of something more than involuntary manslaughter. But my experience has been people lie for all sorts of reasons. And before you jump to that conclusion, you better make sure that the reason he's lying is because he's trying to cover up a murder as opposed to it being a manslaughter. In the end of the day, all the defense has to do, I know it sounds complex, but all the defense has to do is just get one juror, mm -hmm. one juror to have doubt enough to say, I'm not convicting, and at a minimum, it's a mistrial. But right now, from what I'm seeing in this, from the opening, if I were a juror sitting there and I were gaming this case, and now that I hear how the prosecution's going about it and what the defense's arguments, I'm going to come out and say even more boldly than I did when we were talking about this two weeks ago, this is a not guilty. I, I won't be surprised from what we heard so far, but obviously the case just started. Here's the question. You brought this up a little bit earlier about and, and how the defense pointed this out. If he was going to kill his wife, would you really do it in this way? Now, we handled the case, Bob, you were on to talk about it. It was the Todd Kenhammer case. We talked about it a little bit earlier where a man was charged with the murder of his wife. And he claimed what happened was they were driving a, uh, a flatbed truck past, the pipe fell off the tr uh, truck, impaled the window, and hit his wife, struck her, and she died. Now, he wanted to say this was all an accident. The prosecution said he staged that whole crime scene and he killed his wife. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, the facts are very different there than they are here. But the argument, I'll be the, the uh, devil's advocate here, a guy kills his wife, his guy kills his wife. Maybe he felt it looked better if... In this kind of scenario, I have a who would suspect it is a murder if another woman, if another person is there, if I'm in the car, if I'm in a public space, isn't that one way to look at it? I well, listen. It just it, again, we a good lawyer is going to say use the rule of common sense. It may be a contorted, twisted thing that he decides to do this with a, a, the woman in the car driving the vehicle, who, by the way, gets off an exit, if you recall in this case. And then he decides, I'm going to shoot her right by a hospital. I'm going to try to get her aid. Yeah, is it possible that he wants to make it look that way? Yeah, but why would you? He's a sophisticated, smart attorney. If he's going to kill her or he wants her dead, he's going to do it in a much different way than this. To me, it just resonates. I just don't think it will make sense to them that this is the way he would go about. And shooting through. A, a car seat in a single round. I mean, how many rounds can you shoot at your wife when she's sitting at the front seat and make it look like an accident? How many rounds can, this is what I'd be saying, can you shoot through that car seat and still claim it was an accident? Only one. He's got one shot. He's going to do it in a plastic bag through a car seat that has all sorts of metal and framework and so on and so forth to take a chance it doesn't deflect or move somewhere else. It's just not the way a rational person would do this. Well, what I love about this case is you can argue it both ways, and that's what we're covering today is how the prosecution and the defense are taking a series of facts and arguing it both ways. We are covering the Tex MacGyver case, but I want to let our viewers know that if you go to lawandcrime.com right now, you can watch the James Worley case out of Ohio. It's going underway right now. It's the case of that man who's charged in the abduction and brutal murder of a 20-year-old University of Toledo student named Sierra Joggin. So you can go to lawandcrime.com right now to watch that. Our focus, however, will be remain on the Tex MacGyver case. They're in a break right now. We've seen the opening arguments from both. What I want to continue playing for you is the prosecution's opening statement from earlier in the day. Check it out. The defendant had a makeshift firing range at the ranch. It was a huge mound of dirt back in the back. And you will hear witnesses testify that he would go back there and shoot all the time. And he lectured others about gun safety. He would take Austin back there and shoot and a number of other friends. And they will testify that over and over again, he would lecture them about gun safety. 
And you also hear Danny Joe Carter tell you about a time when a defendant threw a water bottle up in the air, shot it two times before it hit the ground. In addition to the gun being in perfect working condition, at the time of the incident, there was no 911 call. The defendant was seated in the back seat and right beside him, within arm's reach, was his cell phone. And then right beside that on the seat, in her purse, was Diane's cell phone. And right beside that, also within arm's reach, was Danny Jo Carter's purse. And in her purse was her cell phone. And the evidence will show that none of these phones called 911 on that night. Once the defendant got to Emory, he started, people started asking questions and the nurses and the staff wanted to know what happened to Diane MacGyver. Pretty exciting case we have for you to hear today, the Tex MacGyver case. We have a live feed back in the courtroom, so let's listen in. Call is going to take longer than we have before we break for lunch. We're going to break for lunch at about 1230. 